It was Halloween night, 1970. A club full of young people dancing, an up-and-coming rock band from Paris playing as the main attraction. Spirits are high, the club is packed, but what should have been a great night out ends up being a night to remember for all the wrong reasons. A fire breaks out, and within minutes, the club song set becomes the scene of France's worst ever nightclub tragedy. It's 1970. The swinging 60s are officially over, and the heady days of disco are yet to begin, but the nightclub scene is as vibrant as ever. This is the era of the baby boom generation, the children born in the first decade of peace after World War II. This is a generation who have only known peace and prosperity, and with the advent of rock and roll, this is a generation that likes to party. To fulfil this need, nightclubs and bars are springing up all over, and rural France is no exception. Opened in April 1970, the club song Set was the main attraction for the youth of Grenoble, Aix-les-Bains and Chambéry, and was situated a couple of kilometres outside the small picturesque town of Saint-Laurent-du-Pont in southeast France. From the outside, it didn't look like much, a large but nondescript modern building with a corrugated roof. Anyone driving past during the day probably wouldn't give it a second glance. However, inside, the three owners of the club had transformed it to be the latest thing in psychedelic decor. The ground floor housed the bar, stage area and dance floor. Around the walls were small alcoves or grottos where club patrons could sit and drink and smoke and watch the band and the dance floor. A single metal spiral staircase led upstairs where more alcoves looked out from a gallery above. The alcoves were made from papier-mâché and polystyrene, and the support columns were wreathed in colourful plastic ribbons. Plastic banners hung from the roof and were draped on the walls. The entire space was festooned with very loud, very colourful and very flammable material. On Saturday, October the 31st, 1970, the club song set was the venue for a rising rock band from Paris called Storm. Performing their own material, as well as covers from the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, the night was sure to be a sellout. To prevent gate crashing, the side exit doors had been locked. Entry and exit was going to be through the turnstile only. An eight foot high, full door turnstile ensured that all patrons would be paying ones. Nobody would be getting in or going out without going through the turnstile. At about 1.40 in the morning, the club was still packed. There's about 200 young people still watching Storm as they crank out their big finale number, the Rolling Stones hit Satisfaction. On the upper gallery, somebody accidentally dropped a match onto one of the polyester cushions. The people in the alcove noticed smoke and flame and the cushion ignited the fire started to spread quickly to the wall decor. They tried beating out the flames by hand, but it was no use. An eyewitness recounts, I was at the top of the gallery. I saw a small flame on a seat and a boy who tried to extinguish it with his hands. I went down calmly to tell those who were downstairs to get out. It was just as I was at the turnstile that the panic began. The flames had begun to spread, and the first shouts of fire went around the club. The band was still playing when the first flash of fire hit the ceiling decor and the blaze really took hold. Within 30 seconds, the entire roof and walls of the club were ablaze. One of the club owners, Gilbert Bass, was in his office when he saw the alarm light go on. Thinking that there was maybe a fight in progress, he hurried outside to get round to the club entrance. Bass stated, as I arrived in front, I heard screaming, There is fire! And at the same time, I saw people coming out whose clothes were on fire. A huge flame forced me to step back. The sans set was not equipped with the phone, so I jumped in the car to alert the police. Within a minute of the initial blaze, the whole club was choked with acrid black smoke. In the panicked rush for the only visible exit, the crush of bodies jammed the turnstile. After that, nobody got out. The whole place went up in flames. No one inside stood a chance. Gilbert Baz had to drive the two kilometres to Saint-Laurent-de-Pont to alert the emergency services to the tragedy that was unfolding behind him. 
By the time the fire brigade got back to the club, it was obvious that there was no hope of rescuing anyone still trapped inside. As one fireman said, they didn't have a chance, the whole place went up like a matchbox. By 5am the blaze had been extinguished. The walls of the club were still intact, but the metal roof had melted away in the heat. The interior of the club was a charred wreck. The firemen began the task of removing the bodies, many of which were unidentifiable, burned beyond recognition. 140 young people had perished inside the club that night. Of the 40 or so survivors who had managed to get out, six later died in hospital from their wounds. The final death toll for the club sans fire was 146. The victims were all aged between 17 and 26. It is one of France's worst ever death tolls from fire and the 10th deadliest nightclub fire of all time. The victims included two of the three owners of the club and all the members of the rock group Storm. A temporary morgue was set up in the town hall and the charred bodies were moved. The authorities had managed to collect wallets, jewellery and personal items from the bodies. These were to be used to try to identify the dead. They were placed in yellow envelopes. Opening these envelopes and finding these personal effects was how most parents learned that their worst fears had come true on that terrible Sunday morning. For unidentified victims, appeals featuring personal effects were made to try and establish their identities. This one asked for anyone recognising the lady's watch to come forwards with a name. A mass funeral was held two days later, the coffins laid out in the gymnasium of Saint Laurent de Pont. The bodies of those identified were taken back to their local towns and villages for burial. There were 19 victims who were never able to be identified. They were buried in a dedicated plot in the churchyard at Saint Laurent de Pont. The shock and the grief was raw. This was a national tragedy, but it had devastated the local community. People were angry. How could this have happened when regulations were supposed to be in place to prevent this kind of tragedy? An inquiry was set up at once to find out what had gone so tragically wrong at the club sans set. Unsurprisingly, the inquiry didn't have to look far before it found some obvious failings. The local building safety department hadn't inspected the club before it opened, although it was required by law to do so. The legal limit on the number of people allowed into the club seemed to be missing, there was no paperwork showing what it should be. The interior decorations that were made from plastic, polystyrene and papier-mâché were completely illegal and should never have been used. The building should have had three access doors. It turned out that one had been sealed up during the construction of the club and the other two were locked on the night in question. These two emergency exits weren't illuminated and they were both blocked by stacks of chairs and a screen behind the band. The gallery level had no exit. People were forced to flee down the narrow spiral staircase and into the club below. There was no firefighting equipment on site, even though a list of this should have been sent to the town hall and signed off before the club could open. There was no telephone. Now, this wasn't a legal requirement, but given the remote location of the club, common sense dictates that a phone should have been one of the first things that was installed. Against the background of these obvious failings, the local mayor, Pierre Perrin, and the secretary-general of the prefecture, Albert Ulrich, were suspended from duty. Public sentiment was becoming increasingly hostile and frustrated. On November the 6th, the French interior minister announced that the club had in fact been operating illegally, as there had been no formal inspection prior to opening in April 1970, and the mayor had never granted official permission for the club to open. Mayor Perrin and the two building contractors involved in the construction of the club were charged with causing injury through negligence. They were found guilty and sentenced to 15, 13 and 10 month suspended sentences. Gilbert Baz, the only surviving owner of the club, was charged with manslaughter and sentenced to two years in prison. This was later reduced on appeal to 18 months suspended. Baz continued to live in the area, working in a local paper mill. He never spoke publicly again about the incident, and he died in January 2021. It's clear that many others were involved in turning a blind eye to their duties in regards to the safety of Club Sonset, 
Indeed, it's reported that the local chief of police and an entourage of other local officials were drinking in the club just two nights before the fire. It seemed that all the regulations in the world won't do any good if the people in charge of enforcing them are incompetent or lazy. There is a memorial to the 146 victims at the site of the Club Sunset. The building itself has long been since demolished, and there's now a grassy open area where it once stood. People in the local area still remember the tragedy as if it were only yesterday. Take these words from Jacqueline Bougil, a nurse who was on duty that terrible Sunday morning back in 1970. Fifty years on, she spoke of the tragedy and how she still remembers it vividly. On November the 1st, I was working in the emergency department. A colleague of mine had received burns from the dance club and she'd called for me. I enter. I discover an inert body. She's totally charred, the belt embedded in the charred flesh. Only the whites of her eyes and the belt buckle stood out. A strong smell filled the throat and you could feel the heat coming off from her. This is the painful and macabre memory that I've kept.